Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 107, Death Coming Like Black Smoke. In 1349, the plague arrived in England. It did so, as it did so many times before over the previous few years, by ships in ports around the south coast. They would arrive into the merchant city of Bristol and from there spread throughout Britain and Ireland. The disease originated from China, moving rapidly through Asia and into Europe and through the trading cities of Italy, possibly through crusaders and merchants who were traveling across the Mediterranean. Whether it came through rats, fleas, or people did not largely matter in an era before modern medicine and medical practices. It was seen mostly as a great punishment sent from God in an era of superstition and deeply held belief. Medicine in the medieval world was broken down into two areas of the practical and the academic, and largely those two sides seemed to consider the other as less than useless. Medicine had become a bigger part of academic life in the Middle Ages, as both universities are established and as Greek and Arab texts arrive from the east to the western centers during this crusader period, obviously as they interact with the Byzantines who had ancient texts, and of course, the Arabs who had been studying the remains of ancient Greek and Roman texts and had kept different ones than the ones that were being kept in the West. They had access to different levels of science, had been developing an understanding of mathematics, which was advancing in different ways. Um, Our modern understanding of mathematics, and specifically the numerals that we use, do not come from Latin, where, of course, they have their complicated set of numerals and and numbering systems, but rather from the Arabs. And it's the Arabs where we get that from, including the concept of zero. So this expanded how people understood the world beyond just the religious understanding and the folk medicines that were being practiced at the time. But this has also meant that some of the earlier understandings and philosophical ideas that were built into the classical developments in the classical period were much weaker in how to deal with medical problems. In classical Rome, for example, it was against the law to dissect someone, which would hamper the ability to understand exactly how the body functioned. As a result, a great deal of our modern understanding really only began after the period of the, during the Enlightenment. Surgeons who had to deal with the day-to-day of medical needs became very important on the battlefield, and as such were pretty good at dealing with burns, blade wounds, and arrow punctures. In fact, I think we'd be surprised at how good they were with them, including the use of things such as antiseptic to fight infection. However, disease was something very different and much more difficult to understand. Until the modern understanding of bacteria, much of the cures and solutions to these diseases were at best educated guesses based on observation. In England and Wales, for example, unlike other parts of Europe, dissection was forbidden up until the Tudor period and was only lifted fully in the 19th century after a thriving black market existed of cadavers. So much so it took a famous case to overturn this mentality. This happened when William Burke and William Hare were arrested for selling cadavers of people they had been killing to Robert Knox for his anatomy lectures in Edinburgh, creating an outcry that demanded that the government overturn its restrictions. In France, against the advice of the Pope, many of their leaders believed that it was that the disease was being spread by cats and thus slaughtered many of them. This, of course, would create problems considering the chief role of cats was to kill rats, which were actually the plague carriers via the fleas that they had on them. Also, people began to accuse others of witchcraft and Satan worship for the spread of the disease, and likely more than a few were victims of mob violence who were looking for an easy scapegoat. This obviously is something we know a little bit about, and you can understand in an era where understanding microbiology was out of the question, the look and search for answers became very much pinned to the idea of punishment from a heavenly source. The clergy, who largely avoided these camps, were left to try and save people, both spiritually and medically. Many of the monasteries in Europe, for example, acted as social safety nets in the place of governments. They served as hostels for travelers, charitable welfare for the destitute and poor, and took care of the sick. 
Like their predecessors in ancient times, they became the hospitals for the sick and dying and represented the foundation for what we know as our modern hospitals. They became the front lines of the disease and as such suffered an unusually large death toll to match. Wales, as it urbanized, did not escape the Black Death. It is estimated that the Welsh population was reduced by a quarter, possibly as high as 50%, depending on the estimates, which is very much in line with what we think happened in the rest of Europe. Most of these deaths occurring in just one year, 1349. There were three main strains to the disease, the bubonic, which was one that most know due to the way in which it appears with massive bulging sores that would appear around the plague carrier on various parts of their body and would be very, very obvious. This, this was usually caused by victims being bitten by rat fleas. Pneumonic was caused instead by breathing in the infection, which, of course, may have given rise to the idea of the plague being bad air related. Of course, that's one of the original concepts of how you got it was by breathing in bad air. Thus, a lot of people would tie perfumed hankies to their faces in later years and wear masks to try and cover themselves from the smell, thinking the smell was the cause of the disease itself. Um, And we can see depictions of healthcare people in later eras wearing rather unique sets of masks to protect themselves, looking like birds, looking very, very peculiar, but they were actually relatively effective in this case. The worst one was septicemic, which was caused by flea bites infecting the patient. During the Black Death, septicemic was a death sentence. There was no recovery. The plague is predicted to have arrived in Wales around April 1349. It was brought, scholars now believe, by travelers from southern England arriving in Wales by sea. The spread of the plague was typically carried by merchant trading vessels and would eventually lead to the quarantine of ships entering centers. This was very much something you would see, especially in the Italian ports, where they would effectively bar the door to any ship until such time as they could tell whether or not that ship had the plague. So effectively, they would just leave them out there until such time as either the plague had taken effect from what they knew or didn't. This also coincided with a period of Welsh dysphoria, as more and more people moved from Wales to England and to France, creating even more ways for the plague to migrate back and forth, as, of course, people traveled back and forth. There were merchants, as we talked about in a previous episode, who used to go across northern Wales into England to ship goods and then come back, going into port cities, which obviously were some of the worst hit. So these kind of people were not just bringing it back to, you know, major port centers, but they were going back to their little villages and farm communities and spreading it that way without even knowing they were sick. And so, of course, once it starts to arrive in this degree, there's almost no turning back because there's no way to stop it at that period. The moving of goods from China to Europe, which had become a very, very popular thing at this point, especially as spices, silks, and other uh, materials started to enter into medieval Europe, brought a form of luxury with them. It also brought these diseases rip-roaring through. And, of course, this is how it got here. As the Italian city-states, which were the chief shippers, became ports of importance for ships traveling the Silk Roads. So as ships would come out of India and into, and then travel across the Indian Ocean, and then they would end up in the Arabian Peninsula and then would move across the Mediterranean to Italy, they would, of course, carry all this with them. In Wales, these trading towns that had been developed by Edward and his successors would be key to the spread. Carmarthen, for example, as mentioned previously, it was an important trading town. It was a customs collection spot, which were amongst the first victims. Like other places across Europe, the disease moved through Wales like wildfire. South and West Wales, which interacted heavily with trade, were some of the worst hit. Caldecott, Pembroke, and Haverford West all suffered massive death tolls. The lead miners of Holywell were virtually wiped out. The initial raging of the diseased weakened a war-weary Britain. To this point, England had fought Wales, Scotland, and then had become embroiled in the One Hundred Years' War. In 1349, as the plague was spreading in Wales, it had also been raging in Paris and France since 1348. And in 
the Hundred Years' War had kicked off in 1340, and King Edward III had found things going generally in his favor, until 1348, when the Black Plague took a financial and medical toll on the English crown. To quote, and to be fair, I'm sorry, I probably mangle this name, but Dr. Mike Ibiji, the plague in Wales and the marches were pitiless as they were elsewhere. At Whitchurch, an inquest was held into the death of one John Lestrange. It was revealed that John had died on the 20th of August, 1349. His oldest son, Folk, died two days before the inquest could actually be held on the 30th of August. Before the inquest could be held on the Folk's estate, his brother Humphrey was dead too. John, the third brother, survived to inherit a shattered estate in which three water mills belonged to him were assessed by only half their value by reason of the want of those grinding on the account of the pestilence. His land was deemed worthless because of all the tenants were dead and no one was willing to hire the land. As you can imagine, that watching an entire population get wiped out in an area like that would have set those with more superstitious ideals very, very off-putting working with people from there. We even see that today. There's talk in Fukushima, for example, where the um, the nuclear power station was destroyed that if you married a girl from Fukushima, you would become, your children would receive that irradiation, which of course is all very ridiculous, but nonetheless, superstition can overwhelm common sense. Many across Wales, like the rest of Europe, appealed to their religious leaders as to why God had turned on them. Some likely wondered if the world was coming to an end, and if this was a sign of things to come. Some likely lost faith in God as they lost their families and their friends. The symptoms were clear, a swelling in the armpit, violent headaches and sores that erupted into a rash and then death. To begin with, in the summer of 1349, Wales was ravaged by the bubonic version of the plague. Likely, what made this whole thing worse was the lack of lengthy growing seasons, as the climate had been cooling during this period. This created more food scarcity, which the people on the brink of starvation and their immune system struggling, they were even more susceptible to what the disease could do. The winter of 1349 saw the arrival of even more deadly pneumonic version. I'm Neil Manthorpe, one half of South Africa on 99.94 with Lungani Zama. We're covering the Rainbow Nation as it undergoes its biggest transition since readmission. We cover every part of the South African game on 99.94 and you can hear us several times a week where you find your podcasts or on YouTube. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of the new Medal of Honor podcast from Evergreen Podcasts, brought to you in partnership with the National Medal of Honor Museum. In each three-minute episode, we'll learn about a different service member who distinguished him or herself through an act of valor. We'll include stories from the Civil War to Iraq and Afghanistan, and from all branches of the military. We'll talk about service members who were overlooked for the medal at first due to their race or religion, and about those who were celebrated at the time. We'll hear stories of soldiers like Audie Murphy, future Hollywood star who mounted a burning tank to hold off German infantry in World War II. And people like Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, a Civil War Army doctor and the only woman to receive the Medal of Honor so far. Learn about these heroes and more wherever you get your podcasts. Which, as we had stated earlier, rather than commencing the cities, it exploded in rural communities. It has been estimated that some villages had their population reduced by as much as 80% from their population in 1348. In Pembrokeshire, of the 35 landlords and their families, the records of death show that 20% died during the spring and summer of 1349. Three died on the same day, showing that the disease, unlike so many before it, had come for the strong, the rich, and the wealthy, just as much as it did for the poor, elderly, and feeble. During the 1360s, the plague returned to Britain three more times, each time wreaking havoc on the communities across Britain and Wales. The result of the Black Death was both harsh and significant. 
the number of people available to till land was greatly reduced, and consequently there were great economic hardships. Fewer people meant fewer degrees of taxation for those who were left, and many farmers and peasants left the country to start new lives in places like England, thus completing what can only be described as a vicious cycle, as you don't have enough people, people are moving out, so there's even less people, and in the process it then creates more starvation because no one's there to harvest the food and get it to the various towns and villages and cities, and so it's a as I said, a very vicious cycle at some points. The great monasteries of the country were badly affected, inevitable for the holy men being the only people offering medical aid for most people, and with the results that were, quite simply, there were fewer monks around by the end of it. Not only did this mean a decline in the influence of the church and therefore Welsh cultural life, it also meant that there were fewer chronicles of these dark and dangerous days. John Gethin a Welsh poet who himself would die from the disease in 1349, wrote, We see death coming into our midst like a black smoke, a plague which cuts off the young, a rootless phantom which has no mercy or fair countenance. Woe is me of the shilling in the armpit. It is seething and terrible. Wherever it may come, a head that gives pain and causes a loud cry— a burden carried under the arms, a painful, angry knob, a white lump. It is in the form of an apple, like the head of an onion, a small boil that spares no one. Great is the seething, like a burning cinder, a grievous thing of ashy color. It is an ugly eruption that comes as with unseemly haste. It is a grievous ornament that breaks out in a rash, the early ornaments of black death. For those who chose to stay in Wales, to stick it out, as it were, the land was now available at reasonable rents. The Encyclopedia of Wales records that there was a subsequent rise in the standard of living for bondsmen as a result of the demands of their service. The calorific content for peasants was higher in 1430 than it was until 1914. However, for so many Welsh people, the Black Death was a catastrophe. By the end of the 14th century, the overall population of the country had been reduced from a total of 300,000 to under 200,000, a reduction of about 100,000 people. Nearly all of that was as a result of the Black Death. This, of course, was just the most famous plague to hit Wales. The so-called Yellow Fever may have arrived in the 6th century, causing the fall of a few British kingdoms. The plague returned numerous times to the British Isles up until the 17th century. For example, in the 1600s, the South Wales town of Tenby was almost wiped out, as the town of under 1,000 people at the time suffered 500 deaths in the plague. Carmarthen had suffered five major outbreaks in 1604, 1606, 1611, 1651, and 1657, but nothing topped the first and most harmful one. The damage done in the mid-14th century was a sea change for Europe. Possibly a third of the population died. Many survived the disease to be permanently scarred by it. Yet this would be something that would also set the course to push Europe outward, to drive it out of the medieval period. Wales would be no different. In the breach left by the loss came a renewed sense of purpose and a desire for survival, which... Much was lost, yet much was yet to be gained. And it's on that slightly more positive note that we'll end this discussion. The Black Death, of course, is something that is a terror to behold. Any sort of reading of it scares the life out of anybody. The understanding of how devastating it was would not really be topped in the annals of world history until the 1919 Spanish flu, which caused millions to die across the world, actually killed more people than World War I in total had killed, and was a devastating disease that passed around the world. It's hard to understand how difficult that must have been for people living in that period who had no understanding of medicine the way we do, who have no understanding of how infections work and what the cost of them may be. In modern times, we've had infections run through our societies. If 
you only have to think back to the bird flu of a number of years ago as an example of something that could in other times have been very devastating, but in modern times was dealt with fairly quickly and the death toll was contained by comparison. The same could be said of Ebola, which has been running rampant in places like Africa, yet gets stopped when it gets to our shores. So often these things in that period of time would have just destroyed society because there would be no way to know about it, no way to really contain it, and certainly no way to deal with it. You can see why, much like at the end of World War I, if you look in Europe, for example, most people started to turn away from religion in that period because of the feeling that if God could allow that to happen, what is the use of him? Or does he even exist? Whereas in America, it almost had the reverse happen, where religion became much more important to society and became much more significant, both at the end of World War I and World War II, which we still have the effects of to this day. Those kind of things happen in these sort of mass periods of disease and destruction of this nature. And certainly, as we said, there are factors beyond the disease itself. There's the climate change. There's the wars that have been going on. You have to remember that wars of the medieval period were not simply fought between just soldiers. They were fought between communities. And and quite often there'd be siege warfare and people would be starved out and most of their crops would be stolen by the armies as they move back and forth. So you can understand why it would do so much damage in places like France, which had been fighting wars for the better part of 200 years at this point. You know, for both the poor and the rich, it was devastating. The difference, of course, in this particular circumstance is how it affected both the wealthy and the poor equally, unlike so other, so many other diseases and sicknesses. It worked at every level. And that was what I think was so much more scary about it. I think to that point, most people had understood that you could lose your child when they're young. Death tolls until you were five years old were rather harsh in that period. In fact, it's our concept of the average age of a human in that period is legitimately coming from child deaths that are happening earlier in life which are affecting the overall total. There were people that lived to their 70s and 80s in the medieval period, but there's tons of others who didn't la live past five. So that's the kind of thing that they would have been used to. You would have been used to your elderly people dying, you know, from various things. But I mean, if you fought in a war and got hit by an arrow and they pulled it out, there was as good a chance that as long as it didn't hit something vital that they could fix it, they could antiseptically take away the possibility of infection, and thus keep you alive, and they could stitch you up. But with a disease like this that doesn't have any markers, doesn't have any way of seeing how it's coming to affect people, it becomes deadly because of that. And that's the biggest difference, and that's why it was so devastating. And that's why in the modern era, it doesn't affect us the same way. And that's why we were able to stomp out so many things through inoculations, through proper medical care, through being able to identify and understand how diseases are formed, made, and how they attack the body. All of these things, of course, are something we've had to learn because of these kind of things. So while we probably won't cover the bubonic plague again in this podcast, be aware that it does come back over and over again for about 200 years. Comes in, kills a lot of people, leaves. Comes in, kills a lot of people, leaves. The idea that it just continued to cycle as shipping continued to cycle from these areas. So it just continued to carry the plague around in a big circle. And it unfortunately had much to work with. So until they could sort of stamp it out eventually and stop that, it just had lots of opportunity to continue to grow and to progress and become problematic. But uh, anyway, regardless of all that, I wanted to thank you all. And I hope if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you'll reach me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com or you can reach me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod or on facebook.com forward slash Welsh history.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. And take care, everyone. Bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. And for everything we do, check out distractionsmedia.com. Hello, this is Gary Chahot welcoming you to check out the French History Podcast. Our main show covers the history of France from the first humans until present. If you liked Mike Duncan's The History of Rome and wanted a similar program covering the land of beauty, culture, and love, we are exactly that. We also host world-renowned scholars who have delivered guest episodes on their specialties, including 18th century pirates, revolutionary booksellers in 20th century Paris, the special friendship between the Marquis de Lafayette and Thomas Jefferson, and numerous others. Learn what you love and listen to the French History Podcast today.